Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to episode 86 of the Mind Heist podcast. Muhammad. Hello. Uh, do you like uh, ginger ale? I've got ginger ale right now. I don't think I've ever tried it. It's quite I, always, I was always quite... I was quite, you know, um, averse to stuff that sounded like alcohol. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> growing yeah. up, I had Have ale, tried, I had um, ginger beer, like, beer. Uh, yes, it was absolutely awful. Was it flavored? No, I had. Mm. I think I've had flavored like barbican before. Yeah, yeah, that, that was one. that was all right. But then I've had, yeah. I had like when I was in Morocco, it was on the menu like non-alcoholic beer. Some restaurant mm. I went to, and I thought, oh, why don't I try that? It was yeah. absolutely awful, bro. Mm. Didn't like it. At Wasn't all. flavored that one. No, no. Mm. So I was like, oh, it's just what people put themselves to. <laughs> well, I think uh, actual beer is very sweet, from what I understand. Oh, really? um, so it probably wouldn't taste like that. Yeah, the plain, the plain one is horrible, but the barbecue, the flavored ones, yeah, it's quite good actually. It's got that bubbliness from the. <laughs> from the malt or whatever and then it's but it's full of sugar it's like it's not too different from a fizzy drink really yeah but, um on one you know these programs they do in england um they said in one of them is one of those like diet kind of things um where they do these fake experiments with like a sample size of five people and then they try and act like it's conclusive or something all um, right yeah but actually oh, oh yeah um and they were saying uh that a pint of beer it has the same calories as the equivalent volume of butter. Like, like imagine wow. you're drinking a pint of butter, how much energy would be in that? So yeah. that's where you get the beer belly from, I guess. I was going to say, yeah, that's probably where beer belly starts. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, yeah. man. Okay, bro. Go so on. I think I've got an interesting topic for us this week. So I'll just introduce it by saying that I think, you know, me and you and many of our listeners, I'm sure, uh, we come from uh, parents' backgrounds who immigrated to another country, right? right. Uh, whether, it's, whether it's to the UK, US, or even in my case, uh, after the going UK, then going to another country, not even in the West. Um, mm. But our parents immigrated for a better life. And uh, in most of the cases, they went from being, you know, village people, maybe from uneducated families in terms of their parents were not educated, maybe their brother, sister, not educated. And then... A lot of them went to and became educated, you know, before or after immigrating. And by doing that, like getting educated and then immigrating, they actually went from being what you might call working class to middle class. And because of that move, they like we grew up as middle class or uh, low, maybe lower middle class or upper lower uh, working, class, whatever you want to call it. Um, so I feel like that is a huge shift isn't it? Like mm. to go from being a villager with no, nothing much economic activity you can do other than grow stuff, be a shepherd, maybe some market trading stuff to having a job, having a good income, uh, you know, all of that, being able to buy house or whatever it is. So it's a very, mm. very big jump. So the, the kind of topic I want to talk to you about is like, okay, now like if when they pass that baton onto us, like what do we do from here? Right. Mm. So, yeah, like what? What are your thoughts on that? Firstly, like, why don't you why don't you tell me about like your dad's or your parents' move? Like, what was how big a step was it from where they came from to kind of where they are now? Um, I'd argue if they didn't come from the same well class class systems is different. Like working class here isn't working class in North Africa, is it? But yeah. but if we did do that, then I'd say that we never. They came from working class, you know, in, in, in North Africa. Mm. I don't think they've ever tapped into middle class here. I think they've always been working class here. Mm. However, being working class here has allowed them to, to build that which would make them maybe, I don't know, lower middle class up in, in North Africa. Right. Um, so let's, like from my mum's side, so she came here, um, with like a lot of women her age, they came here with their families as opposed to coming here on their own. Mm. So my mom, my mom came here with the rest of her family because my granddad came here. Mm. Oh, not with, the, with, not with your dad? No, 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 because they're different oh. countries. So, oh, yeah, my, yeah. So my, mom was in, true, yeah. yeah. My, so my mom is from Morocco and mm. I, think her dad, I, was, I could be getting this completely wrong. And my mom's probably listening, thinking, 
what, what, what are you talking about? But from my understanding, um, my granddad was married already, came over. I think he might have come here on his own first. I'm not sure. But I've, either way, they, they all came here eventually. Um, worked in like restaurants and, and, then, um, and then eventually into like, ag, like horticulture. So like greenhouses and stuff like that. Um, but because of that, I, I don't know too much about my granddad, how he sort of saved and stuff. But he built quite a lot back in Morocco to the point where now, alhamdulillah, there's quite... My grand is my grandfather's passed away, but my grand, my grand is still, you know, still alive and kicking, and she's sort of taking care of things. And alhamdulillah, they've got quite a few apartments and stuff like that, um, all in one sort of block. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you know she, she's it's well because she's supporting herself with the sort of what the legacy was that they built here. I mean, yeah. a lot of there was always this choice I think with people that came over to the west or came over to the UK is whether they. The background that I came from was that you come here, you say you send money back home, you don't build anything here, you don't put your roots here. Yeah. So nobody really. Uh, it wasn't until the further generations that started buying houses here or buying businesses here or stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, like my once again, my my grand my granddad did that. My mum kind of my mum and dad echoed that, so they didn't build any roots here we haven't got any businesses here any property here whatever mm. it was just sending money back home yeah. but like my aunts and uncles are a bit different um some of them went half half some of them tried to do a bit here and a bit there some of them are completely here with nothing over there mm. um and you've got that in different you know different sort of cultures like if you look at i don't know maybe pakistani community uh, predominantly a lot of the ones i've met um they've been here for much longer than a lot of other sort of cultures and communities and because of that they've set really established roots here they've got houses here they've got businesses here this is basically where they will be mm. um my dad on the other hand he he basically he grew up in tunisia till about maybe 17 ish um but he he grew up in a time where like education system was a bit all over the place because there were strikes and stuff on mm. um from what i recall he he had a job lined up like he'd applied for this job through my granddad helping him and stuff to work in a bank and he sort of had this choice i think he had like six months or so before he started mm. um so he thought oh i'll go to the uk and try and get into school education in the uk instead of doing this job mm. and i think like my granddad was sort of like no just stay here kind of you know we've got a job for you there's no need for you to go all the way out there but he wanted to anyway Mm. because he was you know young and a teenager or whatever Mm. (laughs) um and he'd long story short he went out uh to europe essentially france switzerland and then the uk i think and um really really like the way he because he's been talking to me a lot about it recently it's like really sort of like adventurous like you know, going with just a backpack and a frying pan or, do you know uh-huh. what I mean? And, yeah. oh, and like just sh- turning up in random places, just asking if they've got work and then mm. working. And like, that's what it was like sort of back then. You could mm. just do that. And yeah, yeah, it's a really wild, really sort of like uh, nothing to lose kind of mentality. And anyway, long story short, eventually um, uh, met my, um, met my granddad. Mm. So the way he, 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 he obviously got married to my mom was, he was friends with my granddad because they worked in the same sort of industry up right. north. Mm. And, you know, that's how sort of they got to know each other. But yeah, same mm. thing. So he was sending money back to Tunisia. Uh, my granddad was sending money back to Morocco. Um, and alhamdulillah, they both managed that way. So, mm. yeah, ultimately, um, in terms of like the class, like if my if we were all to move to Tunisia, like in, in, my, in my British worldview, we'd be living with less... Mm. sort of um i don't know luxuries than we have in the uk mm. even though we're working class here or whatever you want to call it but in tunisia we'd be living a lot better than most people do you know what mm. i mean mm. because yeah. of it's because what's been established so mm. so would you like you consider your upbringing working class upbringing yeah oh yes most definitely yeah yeah i mean uh, especially here I, I spent a couple of years in Tunisia where I don't know if it's because of the notion the title of being from Britain or being a lot of people have that like when you go to to 
uh, when you go to Algeria, do you feel like you're treated a bit differently because you're from Europe? Well, you've lived in Europe or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, um, I guess, uh, I guess maybe this is kind of, I think, how it works. I, I haven't been there for like three, four years now, so it's tricky to remember. But uh, usually the first reaction is to treat me differently. Yeah. But when, when I kind of insist on being normal, then they just treat me a bit more normal. But obviously the first few conversations with someone is all about, oh, so how do you live? Or where do you live? Or how is it like there? Obviously yeah. that's going to dominate it. But yeah. uh, I, I really try uh, a lot to be like normal. Uh, and sometimes it's very hard to escape that I'm not normal, but uh, I avoid that kind of thing of, yeah, he's different. I try to. Mm. It's it's almost like a false, sometimes it can be like a false title, like just because of the passport, they treat you like you must be wealthy. Like that was something I yeah, battled with exactly. when I was there. Yeah. And was, you know, uh, I don't know if in Tunisia they have the same term, but in Algeria we say migri. So oh, well, that's some, that's me, mean, yeah. that means migrant. Yeah. So yeah. they might call me a migrant, even though I didn't immigrate anywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, yeah, I did yeah. actually technically, but I didn't migrate from Algeria to anywhere, you know, but they yeah. would call me that, right? Even though it was my dad who was the one who uh, immigrated. Yeah. But this label, obviously there are assumptions that come with that label, like you're saying that you have a certain amount of uh, wealth and stuff. And I think there is definitely a difference between, because you know, like going, flying from Dubai to Algeria, you're on the plane full of Algerians who live in Dubai, right? And there is a difference clearly between the Algerians who live in England, for example, or France, and those that live in Dubai. You know, the ones who live in the UAE generally are going to be much more com comfortable, you know, uh, mm. their, their jobs, whatever, they're much more well-paying uh, mm. situation. Uh, and then UK and France, is up, it's very mixed, right? But yeah, um, but, yeah but, you know, for, for my dad leaving Algeria, like, he, he was born when the country was still colonized, of course. So the All education right, yeah. situation was still messed up. Um, but he did go to uni there and he graduated from uni there. And he had to like, he had to leave his like hometown, like small kind of town. He had to leave yeah. that in order to study. And I think the state like kind of was encouraging this and helped out because obviously by the time he was university age, then, you know, colonization had ended, if you want to say it ended ever. Um, and yeah. uh and, and then he got the opportunity to, to further his studies in the UK. So he got to go to the UK via studies, right? So I guess my dad, uh, you know, his parents were not educated. They were farmers. So his, him and his brothers, they were the first who were able to kind of go uni. And he, because he's the youngest, he, like the education system was more developed at that time. So he was able to like go uni abroad and the state kind of would help him with that and stuff like that. Yeah. But his older brother his eldest or uh, one of the eldest brothers, he couldn't even go to school where he was. He had to go to Morocco, like illegally to go to school. So he wow. started school at age 14. Imagine that. Like he yeah, never yeah, yeah. school till he was 14. So he yeah. had to like try go through the border and those police and those like border, you know, border guards and this and that. And it, it really struggling, man, to, to just to get an education. But he's mm -hmm. ended up being a professor at uni now and um i guess let me think all of my uncles but one uh, has a, been to uni so i think that was a big shift because go, going to uni allows you to get a certain caliber of job and yeah. uh, and then when you couple that with finding i guess a job opportunity in the uae then it really takes it next level so yeah. when my dad was in the uk and you know i was born there and stuff um i i think we were living in a I, I don't know how to define, is it, was it working class? I guess it was working class situation. Um, I guess without some of the aids of the state, you know, like council housing and these things, it would have been maybe impossible or very, very, very hard. Um, but then I suppose once we left that and we came to UAE, that was a big, you know, even bigger jump, I suppose. And yeah, I suppose UAE is a bit fancy, but compared to people, like if I look at, the families of my dad's colleagues, we always lived less fancy compared to them. I don't know why that is, you know, uh, if it's just the way my dad's mentality was or uh, financial organization, I don't know. But 
I, I appreciate that because, and visiting Algeria as well, it just keeps me a bit yeah. grounded. Because, you know, over here, man, it's very easy to just get fancy and ha start to have these, uh, consider certain luxuries to be like bare minimums for you. And, you know, yeah. it gets, it gets really also, crazy. I suppose what we also sort of um, forget is that a lot of stuff isn't easy paid for like a lot of it is just finance store it's to keep up this image that you yeah. can afford all this stuff yeah and we can't yeah. like that's one thing i always forget when i can when i do sometimes compare myself to other people i'm like how are we working the same job and you've got this and i've got that like that happens a lot like we have yeah. a shared car park at work yeah um so when i drive in i'm like how is he driving that like what, what are they like we're on the same do you know what I mean? Like yeah. we own the same thing. So like, how is he? Um, and then I realized, oh, actually, it's because I pay for everything I have up front and you yeah. don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, you know, when I think about it over here, the same applies, okay? People are, people are living on credit. They're, they're living their lifestyle on credit. And it's very easy, actually, to spend money here, maybe easier than the UK, because... I suppose this is my guess of, of how it worked, right? So people came here 20 years ago and back then the cost of living was low and the pay was very good and no taxes and all that. But as time has gone on, it's become more and more expensive to live here. But that expectation of living very comfortably has stayed. So now it's yeah, like course. you're getting paid the same. Everything's more expensive, but I still need to have like a brand new Mercedes. I still need to have this and that. I still need to send my yeah. kids to private school. Yeah. So um, that, I think that's a strain on people, but people still, still do live that life. Like they might be getting paid, especially in the UK, what you might consider a very high salary, but they're still yeah. living on credit. Because in the UK, if you're earning 50K a year, then yeah, you might get like a small uh, BMW, for example. But here it's like, no, no, you got to get the X5 brand new. You know, it's yeah, like yeah. the standards higher. So definitely people are feeling that pressure. Um, I mean, both like Emiratis and, and uh, foreigners here, both feeling that I think. Um, but yeah, I, I just, in terms of this topic, like my dad has, I just feel my dad's made that double jump in terms of he's gone, he, he, you know, very, you know, he'd be, he would be considered a middle class for sure. And so that's a big jump. And then the fact that he got educated he didn't, he got, he's actually got a master's degree. So it was like double educated. So he's yeah. made a huge leap. And I almost feel like, what can I do? I can't, like, do you think we can possibly, like, what's the next step for us now? Like, can we make an equal sized jump that they made? Do you think that's possible mm. for you, for example? I don't know. I've been thinking about myself in terms of positioning, what my role is in all of this. And yeah, I, sometimes I just think I am. I'm like a bridge for someone else. So like I keep the, like what can happen is if you're all ch sort of chasing, I don't know, the, the oh, I don't want to say the dunya, but in that sense, yeah, very dunya focused sort of goals. Yeah. A lot of valuable stuff gets lost along the way. For example, like I've always seen like things skipping generations. I always feel like, uh, like, okay, my granddad was quite religious, right? And alhamdulillah, my dad is now, but he wasn't always. So a lot of his, thinking was very dunya focused mm. and because of that the spiritual side of the family like my dad's side of the family kind of waned mm. right and then i see myself like that we me and my dad clashed a lot because i was i'd consider i was a lot more dean focused in you know in, the, in that sort of thing which yeah. uplifted the spiritual side of my family mm. um, and then i think i don't know about my son like i'd like to think and inshallah my son is also going to strike that balance mm. but it's it's like, what do we put first? Um, I think because, because of the whole Tunisia thing that I've got going on, because of, right, the level of uncertainty I've had on, I don't really know where I'm going. Mm. I've kind of just, it's just work hard or whatever opportunity I get in front of me, but I, don't, I can't think about my future whatsoever. Like, I can't think. Yeah. I can't even think what's happening tomorrow because I just, it's really like pulled the rug off my feet um, with everything going on. Mm. Um, but like, like from I, an abstract, more abstract point of view, like trying to take yourself out of the current like six month period, let's say, I, like what would it. you I, wish for yourself to, to be able to step up in or maintain the same? Or, this is it. I can't think. I really can't. I, I've, I've always had that struggle where I can't think long term planning. I've always right. taken each day as it comes. Mm. So I've never thought, 
I've, I, I, I think what happened is that I was quite uh, lackadaisical before I was practicing, right? Um, and then, so I was just sort of going with the flow wherever it would take me. I never had like this, oh, I need to achieve this, this, and this, and this. Like I never really had that. And then I started practicing. And because of that, I think I started practicing at a bad, not bad time, but like I had bad uh, perspectives that sometimes um, you could make worse by certain notions or understandings of Dean. And I'll give you an example. Mm. Like being lackadaisical in the dunya, coupled with, well, it's just the dunya yeah. and you should focus on the akhirah. Combining those two is a bad mix initially. Mm. Mm. That's putting aside all the things that the dean teaches us about excelling and, and aiming for the best and stuff. Mm. A lot of that I didn't really discover until later on. Mm. So when I started practicing, it was like I was at college. Or I just I just sort of... Um, I was I was trying to do like sciences at college, so like biology, chemistry, and stuff. Mm. I just got really bad grades at them, so I wasn't able to continue them. And then I started practicing, and it was like this combination of like, oh, don't worry about it; it's just the dunya anyway, mm. yeah. sort of thing. And that fueled this sort of somewhat apathy toward towards worldly things. Yeah. Um, and now it it isn't until now, like alhamdulillah, like I'm glad that I've got the responsibilities I have. If it wasn't for the responsibilities I had now, that that's pushed me to think about things more seriously so you when you have responsibilities beyond yourself you realize that you've got to work to, to provide mm. for those responsibilities you know your yeah. family your kids and stuff mm. so as far as me what i'd like to do and my my what i want to do is um i i kind of want to be able to start some sort of um maybe have my own business or something along those lines but actually purposefully start projects and then and, and you spend my money on things that are actually beneficial to the communities around me for example like if i was to live in tunisia hypothetically then i'd want if i was doing quite well financially then i would want to just start projects that benefit those people whether it's like uh resources for kids or or orphanages or or you know community projects or clean it like something as basic as cleaning up the town like that i live in like mm. Something about like, I want to change people's perspectives on like um, pollution and litter in 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 our where we're from, because I think it's, I just think it's something that's really, uh, like we were the leaders of it as Muslim, Muslims, and now we're like, it doesn't even cross our minds. I know a lot of people don't think about it, but I just don't like the 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 filth and the dirt that we live amongst in in. In, you know whether it's north africa whether it's in arab countries in general like we just throw things on the street and that's just gross or like all our rubbish is just piling up we don't really have any established at least in the places i live in the rural areas we don't have any established sort of standards for cleanliness or recycling or stuff like that and i know it sounds like to some people it sounds like really secondary issues but it's about building that mindset and leaving something long term yeah um, well, little things like that. And the Prophet right? ﷺ said in the Bafa Min Al-Iman, right? Yeah. That cleanliness is, is from Iman. It's part of Iman. So is it part of Min Al-Iman or Nus Al-Iman? Half of Iman. I'm not sure which one it is. But Al-Muhim, he connected it to uh, Iman. So, you know, there must be some significance there, at least. You, you, you must give it some, yeah. you know, importance for sure. I mean, what I would what I'd like to ask you is like, Right, let's think about money. Yeah? Imagine we're both successful in terms of, um, I don't know, making it. Uh, okay, let's hypothetically, let's put a hypothetical number on it. Let's just say we were both millionaires, right? If we were both millionaires, how comfortable would you be? What would you comfortably be able to purchase with that money that is of the dunya? Like, you think, like, I think myself when I was younger, oh, yes, I'd really want a Lamborghini, for example, right? Hypothetically. Mm. But now, imagine if I had that money. I don't think I'd be comfortable getting into one. Like I just don't, even though I, f I could afford it mm. and even though I, like, I look at one, I'm like, oh, that's nice. I still don't think I could own one mm. comfortably. Like I could, I might, I don't know, I might have an impulse buy where I get one for like a week and then I'm like, oh no, no, this is too much. Like this is mm. too fat. Mm. I can't deal with that. Mm. So then it makes me think about all the other things that typically rich quote unquote people would spend their money on, like flashy things. So like a lot of stuff is flashy that you can spend your money on. And I'm just like, well, I wouldn't feel comfortable with that sort of stuff. So then what would I end up doing, my, like spending my money on? And then this goes back to what I was saying. It'd have to be like meaningful projects or 
things that change people's lives or like dedicate myself to make an impact on people's sort of well-being like that's really where i'd want to spend my money on yeah. and like yeah. same for like my family as well like what i'd like to be able to do what honestly like my dream well, has always been i think is to just help my family whatever the situation is like extended yeah like, not just like my immediate but like yeah. oh my cousin needs help starting something or start mm. a business for this person or this person or do you understand like stuff like that and then extend that to like my friends extend that to like people that i know personally that might need some help yeah uh, and then the ummah at large and stuff like that. that that's what i want to dedicate myself to yes um but I don't know if you feel the same way. Would you feel comfortable uh, drifting around in your Lamborghini, bro? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm. I guess I've been thinking about this for many years because I, I, I definitely have this crisis in my head of, like, my dad's come so far, okay. Even my mom's come so far, like, and so it's like, how, how? If I was to take the equal size jump upwards, I would have to. I would have to actually become like actually rich. Yeah. Mm. So um, I'm talking like, I guess I would have to earn about, I don't know, let's just say hundred thousand pounds a year. Right. Mm -hmm. That would, that would be an equal step up from what my dad did in terms of finances. Okay. Right now. I think what I'm thinking is I don't actually want that in terms of, I might want that finance finance wise, but I don't want that lifestyle wise. Okay. Yeah. So if I got, like you said, a million pounds, um, I would just, I would like get a new laptop and, um, what else would I get? I'd get a fancy webcam. All right. And, yeah. uh, well, I, I can't, I literally, I can't really think I'd get some stuff obviously for my wife, maybe for my son or some fancy things I can get that would help him with his development somehow. Maybe I would yeah. hire some fancy coaches, um, to just, I don't know, like a, like uh, someone to kick me if I don't go to the gym, you know, these kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how I would live a luxury life. And that is still not a hundred thousand pounds a year spending. Right. So, yeah. but however, I still, I would like to have um, a million pounds in my bank. Right. And I, I think I can make that kind of money go very, very far in terms of impact, like you're saying. So like what we're doing with, with mind heist, imagine if we just put uh, 5,000 pounds into mind heist, um, I think we could do, you know, really a lot of stuff. Um, that's fine. Like I can, I, I, I'm, I believe inshallah with Allah's help, I can make five to 10 K go very far with any project. Okay. Yeah. So the stuff I'm doing with the masculinity book, the stuff, the mind high stuff, um, Sira masters, like YouTube channel, whatever it is. I like each of these, just give it five, 10 K each. It could go so far. So mm. yeah, like you said, like, I'm not, I, I don't know where I would spend a lot of money in terms of material things. I suppose I would, I would buy like three, four houses. Like I probably would do that, right? But yeah. that's more like from a point of view of not having to actually work for money again. So this is it. That was the only, so I had that conversation with my wife recently. I uh, said, like, what would I do with half a million? And yeah. then I just thought I would buy a house and keep the rest in my account and just not do anything with it. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like actively like right here, right now. Mm. Um, and I would just think, well, I would just, use it as like an emergency thing or just you know for mm. for living or whatever i don't know yeah. like i can't think i can't i get really sort of worked up on this because sometimes i'm it's like a conflict of like i should be wanting more but then at mm. the same time i'm like i don't feel like want having more is good for me mm. do you know what i mean uh, mm. at least spiritually speaking mm. um but yeah. there's a lot of things like once you've got kids like one thing i was i don't know about you but have you started thinking about like I know your son is quite young, but have you yeah. started thinking about like what you, what you want for your son when he's older? Like, Oh, mm. like in the same way that our parents wanted for us. So like, I remember my dad was very actively like vocal about what he wanted for us in our lives, mm. like how successful he wanted us to be and what, you know, grades and schools and where he mm. wanted us to go, et cetera. Mm. And then like, I've been thinking about, I was speaking to someone at work about this. I was like, oh, I haven't even had the thought about where I want my son to go to school and what sort of things I want him to study and mm. like setting up things from now so he's successful. Like I yeah. haven't thought about any of that. It hasn't crossed my mind. Mm. And he's, you know, I know he's only three, but it's like, oh, I feel like I should be thinking about this stuff now. Yeah. But, but I'm a, I've got, mm. I think I've got this wrong idea maybe of what Tawakkul is all about. I feel like I just don't worry about anything at all because I'm mm. like, oh, Allah will sort it out. Allah, you know, Allah's in control of this sort of stuff. I shouldn't worry about it at all, you know? 
mm. uh, without actually doing anything, without mm. thinking about it. I feel mm. like I should have a balance that I don't. Yeah, know. you need some level of doing, and yeah. I guess if you're doing, if you're doing what comes to mind in terms of obvious steps, and when you take those steps, it's not because you feel like. Oh my God, if I don't do this, everything's going to fall to pieces. It's yeah. just because, you know, these are, uh, what's the word, sensible steps to take, right? Yeah. Uh, that's why you're doing it. Uh, then that's good. Uh, whereas if you're, uh, yeah, if you're doing it anxiously thinking, if I don't get this right, everything will fail. That's not tawakul, right? So yeah. that, that's maybe the balance. Um, in terms of my son's schooling and stuff, I have thought about it. Right. Even before I, I maybe even got married, I thought about uh, schooling and, and how it yeah. should be. And, you know, for now, I'm not I'm not um, too. I know I've got a few years to go to, to really make the decision, but I'm I don't know, at least from what I know now, I think I'm going to try some kind of actually they're calling it micro schooling. I just came across that term recently, which is basically a school with like five to 10 kids in it right mm. and so it's like uh, maybe uh, different families will share tutors and the so it's like a very small classroom that each child gets they they do get to mix with kids they do learn with other kids but they also have that focused kind of one-on-one -on -one attention um yeah. that sounds interesting to me for now like i've got like i don't know four or five years until i'm actually gonna take action with this but for yeah. now, that sounds interesting. And because if I end up doing that or I do homeschooling, then again, I don't feel there's so much um, preparation needed, right? Yeah. Because um, it's not like I want to send my kids to private school, so I have to start saving up now. Like I don't really plan right now on doing the whole school and private school thing. I think that was one thing that sort of gave me a bit of anxiety was – with traditional schooling, the moment they're in, you sort of feel locked in to wherever you are. Mm. Uh, it's like you're almost going back to school in that sense. Like, hypothetically, if I was to stay where I am now mm. and my son went to school here, I'd feel a certain type of way about ever moving or if there was an opportunity elsewhere, how would I go there? Because um, we spoke about this recently privately. We spoke about, like, my my tenancy here, like, in this flat. Mm. It was like, oh, because I can only leave, like, I've got it – the least I can do is six months at a time. It's like, well, for those first six months, you're, you're trapped in whatever place you are. Mm. And if you find an opportunity in a different city or a different town or even a different country, you're like, well, I can't leave here until my, mm. you know. By the uh, way, isn't, or, isn't there a payout for the kind of contract? So you pay like yeah, an extra I'd assume, month or something. I'd assume paying out would be paying out the re remainder of what's left on your oh. Okay. Do you know what I mean? I mean, you That's might want to check that, bro, because sometimes what they say is, um, okay, if you want to leave early, you have to pay an extra one month, like your last month, pay double rent, and you can just leave. Like, it could be yeah, I don't think they've got that here, because I've asked them before, and they were like, oh, the soonest you can leave is when you end your contract. Like, you mm. give us a no you notify us two months before the end of your contract, and then you mm. you go. And I was like, oh, for goodness sakes, that's not what I wanted. But that's mm. I mean, it may be different with different people and different, like if you're renting yeah, completely yeah. privately or if you're renting, like for an estate agent or whatever. But yeah. all these things, man, just tie us down. Um, mm. And it's even worse when you embed yourself in what we were talking about earlier mm. with like finance plans and, you, you know, nothing you own is paid for, but the things you want to take with you. Um, mm. The basics of that is like phone bills, but like you can have more expensive stuff like cars and whatever. I don't know what else, but yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't like the idea of being tied down. I don't like the idea of anyone dictating to me where I can or can't go in terms of however, um, it's hard to think of what, where I'd want to be and what kind of life I want to mm. have. Like I've been very attracted to the more rural and simple life. Like I mm. find myself just watching like mm. people in North Africa, like on YouTube, just people in mm. North Africa, just like farming or agriculture. <laughs> or Honestly, I just find myself watching that stuff for hours. Um, Do you think we can officially call it Sharif life? Yeah, Sharif life, exactly. <laughs> but this is it. Like, I find myself looking at that stuff all the time. And I know it's really weird because mm. it kind of goes back to what you were saying. Like, a lot of our families, like my father left that lifestyle, mm. you know, really actively to go mm. elsewhere. Yeah. And, to do, and then, like, it's so strange, like, how now I'm looking at it like, oh, that's appeal. That's more appealing. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> you know, like it's generations funny. always skip like that. Like, yeah. you know, like you've got kids that are like, 
super practicing and their parents are not interested whatsoever. Mm. You've got parents that are like super into money and stuff. Mm. And like, but their kids just don't really care. It's like the yeah. least of their worries. And then you've got vice versa. You've got parents mm. that are like really, really religious, but their kids are just lost. Mm. Like, do you mm. know what I mean? And I, yeah. it's, it's this constant I, thing that I, I think see that's all why, the time. That's why, I, I, this is my theory. When I was like coming out of uni, I was almost like, I was happy to, to work, but mm. I think basically I wasn't in as much of a hurry to work or to make money, let's say not work, but make money. Mm. I wasn't in as much of a hurry as I should have been. And part of that is because I guess I've been living too comfortably, like in my childhood. And so yeah. I didn't have that kind of any kind of scarcity or kind of anxiety around it maybe. And Obviously, meanwhile, my dad is like, come on, like, you got to work, you got to get a job because he grew yeah. up like that. But me, yeah. I'm, I very, you know, sadly, I felt a bit secure in just like, okay, taking my time, seeing, okay, how can, like, there was no question of, am I going to work? I need to work, all of that, alhamdulillah. But there was a hesitancy. Basically, what it, you know, it was, I was very picky in how I want to work or where I want to work, you know, yeah. what, what, you know, what kind of company or what kind of uh, job. I was picky, whereas, yeah. you know, my dad's generation though wouldn't have been picky with that so much. You Just know? do it, yeah. Yeah. This is it, man. I mean, I I don't know if I've got this thing against the concept, not the concept of work. Like, I understand that work must be done. However, the way that work is 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 manufactured today, I think that's what I can't gel with. Yeah. I can't gel with this sort of whether it's nine to five or whether it's whatever it doesn't really matter what it is mm. it's like this sort of i am going to be away from my family for most of my time mm. so that i can just put food on the table like that's mm. really what it is mm. and there's no it's not like when i look at the past or at least what i think the past was mm. there's a lot of whole families together doing stuff Working to, together, to food, yeah. working together to put food on the table. Mm. Like if I went with my whole, like if my whole family were like, kind of like what Sharif was talking about in terms of his whole mm. family's engaged in the process of, of yes. putting produce on the table and whether that, mm. that produce gets sold or not. Like that to me is like, okay, that makes sense. Mm. You know, because this portion I'm going to keep for my family and this bit I'll trade. I'll sell yeah. like that. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. But like this whole, like, I'm going to go to an office or I'm going to go to this organization or I'm going to, and I'm like pumping hours into this place, but I don't mm. see anything back from it. Yeah. Do you understand what I mean? Like yeah. I'm, all, I'm, all I'm getting is pounds and pennies, which I can yeah. get anywhere else. And that's what drives me nuts. Like, yeah, yeah. But and I think, then I think that's, that sums us up, bro. I think, I think a lot of our generation, we're picky. Like we're just yeah. picky with how we want to make a living. And because we consider it that we have the luxury to be picky. And yeah. I guess we have for a long time. I mean, who knows, you know, ch maybe times are changing. Maybe things are getting a bit harder or whatever. But um, yeah, it does really seem like we're, we're picky. That's a good summary. Yeah, man. I just I, can't. I don't like, you know, for me, I, I'm, I would be ashamed to say I'm picky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just, like I, like I said in the other podcast, I try to have a old school mindset, right? So being picky is, is not good from an old school yeah. point of view. However, if I'm picky, but I know I have the work ethic, then I don't mind. Like, mm. like to, to know deep down with conviction that I, I am a hard worker, I'm willing to put in the work, but I'm just, you know, discerning and careful about where I'm going to put my work and time, then yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not sh ashamed of that, let's say, you know? Yeah. I suppose I, I do wonder though if it's it's because people have been introduced into this idea of like work hard now and then like retire and have a pension later and that's what everybody's looking for. Like I talk, I just everywhere I go for work, everyone just talks about retirement and pension, <laughs> and pension and pension, pension. So I'm just like, is that yeah. really what the yeah. end goal is? Like, is that yeah. why people comfortably you know work mm. their butts off? Mm. I can't think like that. Um, that's what that's what Tim Ferriss calls the deferred oh, really? life plan. Yeah, I, I can't think like, like that. Man. Like, I'll live when I retire. <laughs> yeah. If I retire before 70. <laughs> I can't. It's hard, man. And I think this, it's also, um, it's, if, you, if you're a person who doesn't really consider yourself too materialistic, like mm. purchase, 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 mm. but then you 
live in a society that is all of that, yeah. then it's almost like you, your balance isn't struck there because mm. I feel like I should only be working as hard as the things I want, if you know what I'm trying okay. to say. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Like, I do, yeah. If I don't want a lot of things, all I want, mm. all I, like I'm, I, I think a lot of the stuff that I try to get in terms of money and stuff, really, and I'm not trying to say this to brag, um, it's just because I feel like, okay, my wife might want something. My parents might some, want something. You know, my kids might want something. But I never really think of like, oh, I really want this one thing, so I need to purchase this one thing. Like, I don't really think too much mm. about what I want because I feel like mm. I've got everything I need. As long mm. as I'm eating every day, bro. Mm. And once in a while, I might get something to, to, you know, a book to read or something to entertain myself. But it's not like I'm the, the age where I just go out shopping for clothes every week or going yeah, out with yeah. my mates every week. Like, I don't mm. do that anymore. Mm. So think, for me, it's like... yeah basics bro like oh you know i've got food on the table can we have something special to eat this week like jummy you know I mean? like a special Some of that cheesecake man cheesecake bro but I, because i can comfortably afford that stuff now and i could probably yeah. comfortably afford that stuff yeah. even with less then but i, I think that's that's the trap okay now usually yeah. that usually the trap would be that you're in a job and you don't want to leave to like start a business or you don't want to leave to uh, follow your passion but actually yeah. from a muslim's point of view that is the trap of working for your uh, desires and your survival versus right like working harder to get more money not for your own comfort but for something beyond right yeah you know that's like obviously i don't have a job i i, I have a business but when i'm working in the business because i could be working less in a different type of business uh, but it would have a more of a ceiling on how much I could earn. But I'm trying right. to earn uh, much more, inshallah, uh, with this business because uh, I do like. I'm I'm not even really thinking about what what do I put on my table. I'm thinking, you know, that's kind of covered. Now, how do I how do I be able to afford to put a thousand pound a month into my ties? You know, that's what yeah, I'm yeah, trying yeah. to think of. How do I yeah. sponsor you know fifty orphans or whatever yeah. it is? That's that's where now my um, motivation, um, ambition goes. And, and that's different from my dad, I guess. My dad was like, you know, we need to survive first. Okay. Okay. Now we're surviving. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let's, let's, uh, you know, I like, I, I guess he, he didn't maybe plan it, but he's like got to the point where it's like, Oh, okay. Well, like we're actually kind of middle class now, I suppose. Oh, I can actually afford to buy that, you know, yeah. not so expensive, not so fancy, but I can afford to buy that house now. Okay. So cool. Yeah. And then it was, I think a lot of the focus was just on making sure we, like his children, educated. Um, but for me, it's like uh, almost like I'm trying to work out a way where I can become more comfortable with less material things so that I can actually afford to put more uh, resources elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of my thinking. So I, I kind of aspire to be, get tough enough so that I can like li live on very little. And, and therefore, mm. uh, two, two options come with that, actually. The ability to live on less and put more of your money elsewhere to do good things for you, um, or the ability to not have to work as many hours, and therefore, you can put your time more elsewhere, you know? Yeah. So I kind of aspire to that for that a bit, but maybe for the older generation, that was like normal, like that level of uh, grit and um, work ethic was standard because you know, just grew up with the need to be like that. I suppose it depends what kind of generation we talk about. Like, I know that like my dad's generation was just all about work, like work, work, work all the time. Like, mm. the, the, you know, people work seven days a week and it wouldn't really matter to them because yeah. they, they had some sort of mission in their mind. Yeah. Um, and especially like Tunisia itself has got that mentality and that expectation, like build, 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 like what are you doing? What are you building? Do you know what I mean? Like if you're not building anything, then you're wasting your time. You need to be building something. So when are you going to put the next floor up on that house of yours? Or when are you going to put the next, right. do you know what I mean? That's a sort of, that's if you go to these countries, bro, that everyone's building something, bro. Mm. Everyone's got something going on. Yeah. Um, but like, Tunisia, I don't know what... do they have those uh, unfinished uh, floors. Where it's like that's what I mean, just, bro. Yeah. 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 They built the, everyone. They could afford the shell, but they couldn't afford yeah. the inner decoration yet. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that is because, you know, a lot of that is because people are, I'd argue that people are just so, like anywhere in the world, people are just so uh, in love, not in yeah. love, in concerned with people's opinions. Earth, basically. Yeah. They're concerned with people's opinions as well. Like, oh, your neighbor's built this. When are you going to build this? Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, which I'm, I'm very unplugged with. Um, mm. I don't know. I think I've developed a bit of a complex because 
think because obviously my my dad hasn't really been around for too too like he spent a lot of time away because of his responsibilities yeah um and a lot of the time like the past 10 years or more out of the country because mm. of his responsibilities so it's important where i'm like i don't really want to do that like i don't want to do that even here mm. like I, I go to work and i'm like my 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 son looks at me he's like oh don't go to work mm. and i'm like yeah you're right i don't want to go either i don't want to go either um he tells you he says it now bro like you know i say oh, and, and going i don't to work. think that and he's like no that doesn't come from a point of view of not having work ethic it's just like well the important thing to me is family time isn't it yeah exactly and i just feel like I don't know. I feel like maybe I put too much value into it that a lot of mm. other stuff doesn't mean much yeah. to me. And like you're saying, it probably comes from what your experience with your dad, right? So we learn from, from, you know, what we saw other people do and, you know, there's a benefit in that, of course. Yeah, of course. I think everyone's obviously different. It's just, I, I try, when I think about stuff like this, I always try and think, mm. you know, I can't help but think like, what were the Sahaba like? Like what was their work sort mm. of routine or how yeah. did, I know it's very different, a very different time. And I'm sure it's a lot more nuanced than I'm making it out to be. Yeah. But it's also like, oh, maybe like I've got the mindset of someone that lived, you know, over a thousand years ago. Like, how did mm. they live? Maybe that's because if humans are all humans and nothing really changes much in terms of our physiological, like, you know, our biology, whatever you want to call it. Mm. Then just because we live in this time now doesn't mean that we're suited for what the society is right now. Yeah, like. Sure there's different sort of society mm. sort of structures mm. that humans may feel a bit more comfortable with in different yeah. areas. Like, yeah. you know, i that's why sometimes when I look at this stuff, bro, I'm looking at, like I've, I've, I've been watching um, a lot of Arabic uh, YouTube channels. And one of them, I don't know if I sent it to you is a, it's this guy that follows like um, Amazir people in Morocco and like just how they live their lives. And mm. yeah, it's quite tough and it's quite strenuous, but also quite simple. What type of Amaziri, like nomads, you mean? Not necessarily. No, these are just, they're yeah. basically, they're not nomads, but they live in the mountains. So they're very disconnected from okay. cities mm. and stuff. So a lot of the stuff they do mm. takes a lot of grit and a lot of community working mm. together and like, okay. you know, collecting, like har collecting some sort of harvest requires a whole community because they can't, get the mm. machines up there because there's no roads and mm. stuff like that mm. um or like farming in general or just like simple or sort of living in general and i'm like that appeals to me so much more to the point where i was like i was watching yesterday bro i was watching like shepherds bro just doing their job and i was like wow that's who's cool. filming these shepherds there's some youtubers bro <laughs> yeah. so you just go around but like i think i look at that and i'm like that appeals to me so much more and, and i try and ask myself the question wouldn't you be bored? Like, wouldn't you be bored just looking at that? And I'm like, no, I don't mm. think I would. I just don't no, think no, I you would. would. You would learn to require less stimulation. Yeah. Yeah. Bro. But I'll tell you I the would... difference, bro. The, like, I, I agree with you. I, I kind of have that, that thinking. But then what you realize is that if they, like, I don't know, fell off their truck and they yeah. had a slip disc, then no, they're, they're really going to struggle. Of course. You know? But at Even, the same time... Um, I remember something, yeah. Uh, Go I, I got a root canal, okay, like four years ago, something like that. No, mm. longer than that. I got a root canal, okay. And I remember the doctor was like explaining, like you have a cavity like inside uh, the, the tooth, okay, inside, not on the outer side. So we have to do root canal. I was like, okay. And he was explaining, he explained it really well. He's like, you know, if you leave this cavity, it will grow and it will grow and it will go down to your nerve right? And, and it will, then it's going to really hurt. But it will eventually it'll kill the nerve. Then when, it won't stop there. It will go down to your actual um, jawbone, right? And it will right. give you such a mad infection, it could kill you, you know? Right. And, so, and, and so that then when he's drilling like deep through my tooth, I'm thinking, alhamdulillah, right? Because yeah. he said in some places where you can't get this done, you, you might die from infection, you know, from yeah. that. So yeah. this is also the reality, like, and that's, that's a reason, you know, outside of, you know, just material things or Lamborghini or whatever, it's no, like true. the ability to pay for like spine surgery. Like it's, it's, that's a big one as well. Yeah. But at the same time, like, I don't know, I, I always give myself the devil's advocate of this. I'm like, well, everybody's tested with something in the sense that like, we are also like, even in the position that we're in now, we get tested with things that are, that are substantial and it's just yeah. like, 
Yeah. And and sometimes you'd argue there might be a level playing field if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't test people more than they can bear. Then that's a blanket sort of that's a blanket level playing field for everyone sure, in the sense yeah, that yeah. in the sense that this person can handle this. So mm. this person has been yeah. tested with this. I think you that know? because of the nature of the dunya, what we know about the dunya, like we shouldn't go there is a limit basically to how much comfort we should seek. I think mm. definitely, right? And yeah. like from a priorities point of view, like Yes, some level of comfort, some level of health is um, needed, right? But mm. when, you go too, when you go too far, it's like now your priorities actually got messed up because like health, the basic level of health might be top priority, yeah? And survival and everything. But um, luxury levels of health might come before your concern for certain parts of the ummah, certain people yeah. that are suffering, you know? And yeah, so yeah, you yeah. might say, look, it'll be nice to uh, have... Uh, I don't know, putting the haram halal uh, aspect of it aside, it would be nice to have like the tip top health insurance for anything yeah. that goes wrong. But then it's like, well, I could actually sponsor like, you know, 50 orphans for like three years with that. Yeah. And then it'd be, it, so the priorities of a believer is, yeah, it, it, I guess luxury level of health and all of that is not the top priority. Yeah. I, suppose. I think we're in a bit of a transitionary phase anyway, with the whole COVID thing going on. I think like you've got so many people that are working from home. I think companies are going to start realizing that it can be done and it's probably a lot more cost effective to work from home anyway. Yeah. I feel like you've got all these office buildings that people are like, you know, using, um, you know, just so they can have everybody in the same place. But then now that they've had to empty the buildings and they've outsourced all their software and their, you know, systems, um, they're going to be like, oh, well, we don't have to pay rent, really. We don't have to pay for this to be catered all the time or cleaned all the time or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you just start. And I think if that's a shift that really people take hold of, mm -hmm. I think it's a welcome one because in such a globe, I think this is it. We live in such a globalized sort of world, mm -hmm. but we're still so picket fenced into where we, where we have to go for our nine to fives. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, maybe this is it like maybe in the next hundred years bro a lot of these a lot of these nine to five jobs that we do won't even really exist anymore like even even stuff like shopping malls and stuff like that like because you know retail jobs in terms of like working in retail yeah. like a lot of like i don't have any desire going out buying stuff like in retail like i don't do that i don't like to do that mm. uh, i don't like window shopping if i'm going to get something and i need know what i need to get then i you know, I go yeah. online and there it is. And yeah, I know people are still going to have to work in, you know, in those sort of industries in terms of Amazon warehouses and God knows what else. But even that may be going away soon with all these AI and robots doing it and stuff. So yeah, I think there is a bit of a transitionary phase. Even in organizations like law enforcement, bro, you've got people that the office base ones, I, I, when I was at work, they, they started sending people to work from home what they would do is they'd give them this USB thing mm. and it would plug into their laptop and mm. it would, it's only like, it's kind of like read only, like they can't access it more than they need to or whatever. There's mm. all this sensitive information, there's rules and regulations on how to use it or where to use it. But it was essentially people working from home, you know, offices were getting cleared out and it was really like, wow, why the hell are we even making people come in? Like, that's what I can understand like why do we make people come in where it's so easy for them to work at home anyway surely it makes more sense so you wouldn't have to pay for them to be here yeah like in the sense you wouldn't have to pay for their the cleaning of that office or the rent of that office or the maintenance of this and that um mm. and now like you you do see it bro like you've got these digital nomads you've got people like people like yourself just work from anywhere they want to work from if they can if they want to mm. um I think that's a big transition going on. Maybe that's what. Yeah. I mean, as, as an employer, right? Not, I don't employ that many people, but as an employer or think, you know, looking forward, let's say I did employ more and more people. I wouldn't want them working from home. I think that's for sure. Really? Um, but I wouldn't, probably wouldn't uh, force them to come into a central office, but I wouldn't want them working from home. I, I just wouldn't trust that they would be able to quite concentrate and stuff like that and get focus and, and have, you know, the distraction. If they want to work in a co-working space five minutes from their home and they can go back yeah. home to have lunch with their family or whatever, then that's great. That's probably the best. Um, or they want to have an office again, close to home, have their own office. That's even better, more focus. But, uh, uh yeah. So neither, 
I would say neither uh, work from home nor you know force them to come to a central location really. Mm. And then I Somewhere think you... every three to six months, I think it would be good for everyone to meet up in person. Um, yeah, I agree with that. I think you know there should still be those sort of meetings and stuff. Yeah. Um, but there's definitely going to be big shifts. Yeah, there as is, long as man. like Facebook said, no one has to come to office anymore, right? And yeah. Facebook uh, has spent you know tens of millions on their offices. So uh. same, I think same with Google and Twitter, and collectively these companies high uh, employee. Um, I don't know. It might be near. It's like half a million people. Or something. I don't know. Yeah. No, definitely, bro. There's a lot going on, man. Especially future-wise. Like, if we, uh, I always speak about the future. Like, oh, it's like a determined thing. But anything can go backwards at any time. Yeah. But I was watching videos today about like the mining of asteroids, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, that's amazing, man. Yeah. Like they were talking about like the value of. It was like a, you couldn't even count the zeros, the value of certain asteroids that are not even too far away that were, yeah. in terms of what the contents mm. of them are, whether it's gold or whether it's some other material. Um, That's mad, subhanAllah, to think, I don't know, for me, to think that there's gold outside of Earth. Yeah. You know? I guess I forget that the whole universe is made up of these, uh, you know, all these different things in the periodic table, right? All these uh, yeah, yeah, elements, yeah. that's it. Um, I guess there are others that we haven't discovered, but yeah, I guess you can find gold and aluminium and whatever. Um, yeah, because I think the, the way this video was saying, it was like, we don't, we take for granted how much of these elements are in our sort of everyday technology. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You've got gold in like your laptop or your yes. mobile phone or whatever. And yeah. eventually, eventually you're going to need more and more of it. But the way they were saying it, especially now you've got like these reusable rockets from SpaceX and it was almost like they basically go to an asteroid belt, pluck, almost pluck one out of its orbit and then use it and like push it Dig towards, in. push it, push it towards like Earth's orbit through yeah. by using the moon as like a sort of rubber band. And then, yeah. Oh man. I and was like, everyone wow. can like tuck in, <laughs> get it, your bro. knives and forks out. The feast begins. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I Everyone think there's a, I guess that's what motivates companies like, uh, what's the Richard Branson one? Oh. Virgin Galactic, Galactic. Yeah. Galactic, yeah, Virgin Galactic, maybe SpaceX, like these companies, that is one of their targets. That's why they're spending so much money is that's the prize at the end um, for some of them that they're looking for. Yeah. Bro, you like, you know, like talking about our kids and stuff. So I think, I think what my dad wanted for me is to uh, make sure I'm educated and basically live a middle class life you know i think that's kind of what he obviously and and to keep my morals uh, on the way of course for sure yeah um uh, for my for my son i i just think it's obviously to have his taqwa intact you know may allah make all our kids from the salihin um and mostly bro it's not so much about like a level results and stuff like that it's about having um perseverance patience work ethic and uh learn knowing how to learn right learning yeah. how to learn and uh, like outside of that like taqwa and then those kind of key kind of skills or traits i think like anything's possible right because i've seen i've seen too many people like not have degrees and just do really well um not be that good at school and do really well or like you know, and people who went to school and did well, and then they kind of, you know, led to too much of an average life, if you know what I mean. So I don't know. That's, that's what I'm hoping. I don't like want to uh, aim for building up some kind of real estate empire to pass on to them because I actually feel that would ruin them um, or it could very well ruin them. So that's maybe different from what my dad was thinking with me. Do you feel like these things are going to be sort of picked up by your son or do you feel like you're going to have to like sort of guide him down that river of where, you, like how, how involved do you think you're going to be in your son's sort of decisions? Decisions? Um, yeah. Like in terms of like much. what you want, like for me, I feel like I'm in that position where I'm like, Oh, whatever he takes an interest in, I sort of support it as long as it's permissible. And as long like, I'll push him to, I'll push him to be the best he can be at whatever he wants to do. Yeah. As opposed to like, 
I don't have this thing in my head where I'm like, oh, I've got an idea what he can do. <laughs> do you know what I mean? He should go yeah, and do yeah. this or he should go do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, yeah. I, I, I don't think that way. I, I just want him to work hard, have the work ethic, have the taqwa, uh, seek the pleasure of Allah. And uh, I, I probably, th there are boundaries. Like there would be boundaries. Like I, I was just, uh, I found out about this guy who, he's an animator on YouTube. Okay, so he does like yeah. animated videos. He's got, I don't know, millions of subscribers, um, but he was actually in medical school and I think he graduated. And yeah. instead of being a doctor, he became a, he did that full time on YouTube. Like for me, that is a fail because you could have been saving lives. You could have been adding benefit to humanity. Instead, you're entertaining. I mean, that's what you're doing in the end. I'm not saying I don't appreciate the work that goes into it, the art, the creativity. I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. But to drop a, you know, a career in medicine and helping people that way, I, I do feel like that is a loss. So when it comes to my kids, like I always push them towards what is more beneficial, like for the world, like for civilization and for the air and stuff like that. I'll encourage that. But as long as they got work ethic, man, because I feel like work ethic and the ability to learn, um, that's, that's it. You'll, you'll be fine after that. I think. I remember, um, I wanted to mention there's a guy that goes to work with me. Mm. Mate, I just don't understand how he does what he does. So he's a doctor, mm. but he volunteers at my my job, right? Mm. On like so many times, so many times, like I see him there. So he volunteers with me. He's also more skilled than me in the sense that he's got more training under his belt. So he's got a lot more um, things that he can do and he's mm. qualified to do. And I'm like, in my job, forget mm. his. Yeah. And he, not only does he do that, but he also does paramedic shifts as well. Whoa. So he works as a paramedic in London. Uh, part-time whenever they want him he works he volunteers with me and he's also a doctor as well and i'm just like what oh, how do you have a life he goes oh there's plenty of time there's plenty of time and apparently like he did his paramedics he was doing paramedics shifts while he was at uni mm. and uh I, mm. I kind of i off the cuff mentioned i was like oh I could go back and do G I could go back and study medicine. Couldn't I? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want me to help you out? Like, yeah, as long as you've got your, and I was like, are you joking? Like, I was like, he goes, no, it's not too late. He goes, how old are you? I said, I'm 27. He goes, yeah, perfect. There's so many people that are older than you that have gone back to do it. Mm. Apparently there's people that are like either paramedics or whatever that have gone back to study, to be doctors and stuff. Mm. And like some people that it just doesn't, it doesn't phase them at all. Yeah. You know, it is uh, possible. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, I, I guess for me, I, I wasn't a science or maths person at uni. Uh, sorry, at, in school. So yeah. that wouldn't, but I can see how that could work. I mean, financially, it'd be difficult to be in uni for like six years um, with wife and kids and stuff. That would be difficult. Yeah. But uh, I do feel like, inshallah, like if I wanted to, to become a developer now, like a programmer, I, I guess I could do that. I guess it's yeah, yeah. inshallah, Yani. Um, I've been learning, uh, uh, start to learn a new language recently using these apps. Um, and I'm really, I, I do feel like it's possible to make really good progress with these apps like Duolingo and yep. Drops. Okay, so I'm using yep. those two. Drop, have, do you know Drops? No, okay, I only so, know like Rosetta Stone. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know if Rosetta Stone uses this, but it, it uses like um, spaced repetition. And I think it's elements of uh, active recall as well. So it's really fascinating if you if you like youtube this i like especially active recall so it's like a way of it's i guess it's mostly for revision but you learn or you revise instead of like reading notes or you know to remind yourself of stuff you actually just answer questions and right. if you if you really don't feel you know the answer you just guess right and when you yeah. get it wrong the system will like know that you got that wrong and it will show it make sure that it shows it to you again and it will just yep. keep the stuff you get right, it kind of leaves that alone. And the stuff you get wrong, it just keeps showing it back to you until you actually know right. it. Right. And right. it's like by, um, it makes your brain work because you, know, you have to answer questions rather than, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, rather than like just reading notes or reading a word or whatever. So uh, I think, so if anyone like is serious about learning Arabic, for example, then uh, Geolingo is good, but I find Drops to be a bit better. So Drops, they have Arabic. Both of these have Arabic. Drops have Ar Arabic. You do five minutes a day. I think in a few months, you, you're actually making solid progress. You've got really? to keep it up. you yeah. you got to keep it up in terms of like do it every day. Don't li leave big gaps. I think you make solid progress. I don't know how much they teach um, grammar, but I think they, they would teach grammar in a, not in like, 
okay, the rule for how to do this is that. No, it's all learned with, like with context, with yeah, uh, just learning from the centers. You kind of work out the pattern. I want to do that. I really want to. I think I'm getting. I haven't done anything yet, but I'm more serious about trying to learn French. I think it'd really benefit me yeah, um, mm. in North Africa and stuff. Um, mm. I think now that I think about it more, I'm like, yeah, that would solve a lot of my angst, like my apprehensions about going over there and being independent really? okay. over there mm. yeah i think if i was more independent over there mm. i feel like if i could speak french mm. then i could get my message across maybe better than if i could speak arabic because so many more people speak french and it's a lot more uh, integrated into uh you know like official documentation and government really stuff yeah. And whatever. Nice, yeah so you know in tunisia like if i'm in school now what language is everything being taught in so it's i've heard it's changed yeah generally it's arabic but, mm. but there is a lot of french stuff as well however i've heard that they're pushing for more english stuff now right yeah but i don't know why i don't know where that's coming mm. from because it's a bit like random if i knew perfect french or i knew perfect arabic and i i, I went to algeria like i know because everyone's been to school and it was all taught in arabic um, really? So I just feel I'm guessing people would like the average like kid who's been through the school and now he's an adult. Surely he would know, you know, because Arabic, decent because Arabic. of most things that are imported, including people and skills are from yeah. France. Then it's like, mm. right. That's so under my belt. Thing is with like French is very important. Yeah. I feel like with, okay. I think with, with Arabic, I'm going to learn that being there. It's one of those things I'm going to learn being there more because yes. I've got a, a good base level. Yeah. You're just gonna it's just gonna be part of the mm. experience french is like another tool in the arsenal because what's going to happen is like mm. they're only going to speak arabic and french they're not yeah. going to speak arabic and english right mm. so what's going to happen is like for the stuff that's arabic fine i'll get by i'll do yeah. that however there's going to be this void yeah, yeah there's yeah. going to be this void whenever the, yeah. the conversation switches to french or this document switches to french whatever that's yeah. when i'm going to be like oh my god i don't know what i'm doing yes, yes it's not like it's arabic and english if it was arabic and english i'm fine yeah. So that's why I think I actively need French because where my Arabic may fail or where yeah. they do not use Arabic, then yeah. I know that French is going to be the thing yeah, I step yeah. back to. Yeah. Do you understand? That's what, that's what I do. Yeah, definitely. When I have a gap in my vocab, I use French and yeah. it works, right? Like they get it. Um, I always they avoid do that. using French, but when I'm like really stuck, I'll use it. Yeah, you know? they do that all the time. Like I'll be in conversation with someone in Tunisia or even in Algeria, I found it a lot. Like I yeah. even I speak to my in-laws and they'll say something, especially the ones that are from Algeria, they'll say something in French and I just won't understand what they've yeah. said. Yeah. But to them, it's perfectly fine. Because but to them, it everything. is Arabic. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. But there, there are some words which are just not used in Arabic, even though they know the Arabic word for it, but it's yeah, just they not use used. It. They're not, it's not said. Yeah. 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 So, so, bro, just finally, in terms of, you know, where our dads came from, then where we are, then our kids, like, what about in terms of, like, we talked about money a lot and, and uh, you know, middle class, lower class, working, like, whatever. But what about, like, like religious commitment, even, like, talab al-ilm and stuff? What do yeah. you see? Once that? again, like, it's hard, but I, I, I just want to, I feel like for a long time, there hasn't been this established focus in my family. Like, I can't think of any focus that has come like yes there's i've got you know i've got, i can recollect people in my family that have prayed i recollect people in my family that have um gone to hajj for example mm. but in, but in terms of um go for it in terms of um it being like the primary driver every day and the thing we talk mm. about a lot and stuff like that like i don't know if it's because this is my lived experience right now and i know what i'm going through but I feel like, okay, I'm, I, my role in all of this is like a bridge to pull my entire family a bit closer to the Dean than it may have been in the past, you know, to get rid of like some of the superstitions that we have to get rid of like, um, oh my goodness, I'm just getting barged in on <laughs> to get rid of, um, all these sort of elements. I feel like, yes, for a long time, the Dean has been forgotten through generations and generations. Like, and the true like understanding of what the dean is, you know, get in the way of all this sort of shirky superstitions or, you know, go visit this person's grave and ask mm. for this and that. Like, mm. these are a lot of things that exist in our cultures. Slaughter a chicken for a uh, wali. Yeah. Yeah. So like, yeah, I'm not saying that we can't do both. I'm not saying that at all. However, because my family may have positioned me in this place, like, especially the ones like 
like Tunisia and Morocco, they they view me as like, oh, you're the religious guy, mm-hmm. you know. So let me let me go get a fatwa from you. Yeah. So it's like they pushed me into this sort of box. Yeah. But I don't mind owning it. I don't yeah, mind yeah. owning it if it's going to yeah. benefit. Yeah. You know, my yeah. family in the long run. So that's where I sort of position mm-hmm. myself. So maybe, bro, like you, this is the big area where you can have your big jump up if you like. Yeah. So like, if 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 your dad brought you your family or whatever up so much financially economically whatever maybe dean wise you can have that big jump inshallah maybe. yeah and not just and and i don't want the dean to just be what people think the dean is in terms of you know the the kutub and the 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 quran and the sunnah in that sense and that's where it's exclusive no 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 mm. there are there are aspects and elements mm. that are promoted within the dean that stretch beyond that is recognized universally mm-hmm. as good yeah. in terms of the charity work and do in terms of helping people. And I think yeah. that's, that's the Tao I want to give to people. I want to be able to change even their, the way they perceive what Islam is. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is because go into, if I'm embedding myself in Tunisia, for example, mm-hmm. they've got this thing, bro, where they think that they associate religiosity with extremism. So, mm-hmm. so deeply, especially in the political landscape mm-hmm. to the point where I want to make big moves in the day-to-day mundane in terms of helping people in terms of charity work in terms of mm. oh do you need something that's where i want but then also be known as that religious guy so mm. that the, the 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 fundamental perspective that people have of oh it's being practicing muslim or being a a salafi whatever they call it over there because it's got different means or meanings over there to their understanding a salafi is like an extremist you know they think of like daesh they think of isis stuff mm. um, which is really backwards but i want to be able to like make power moves bro in terms of yeah um change especially because the community that i come from is a very small community where everybody knows everyone it's quite a small village and the, the town is quite a small town but to make big impact in something like that that's yeah. cool. that's good for me like that's manageable feasible for me that's where that's know? where extra money will help as well because yeah like it sounds i don't know what it sounds it sounds bad in some way i, I can't describe it but if you went to a village and every, uh, let's say the, the village has a, a market on every Wednesday. Yeah? yeah. You come to the market and you just like bring like free stuff for everyone. Like everyone, bro, it, everyone's potatoes are free this week. Yeah. This is what if I mean. you did bro. that every week, then, and, and you never ask for anything in return. Yeah. yeah. Then that's going to have an impact. Some this people might I mean, say bro. that's bribing or that's it. No. But no, it just, it just works. And the Prophet Sallam did it in some cases like, give gifts to people you know it's something it, parts to you and that's my yeah. that's what i like bro like that's the kind of stuff i want to do like i want to yeah. be able to do that kind of stuff i see these videos of people just turning up and paying off people's bills or yeah. paying off like practical stuff as well yeah. like a lot of the people that did it in the past would come to a town build a masjid and leave and i get it like mm-hmm. i get the whole building a masjid thing Right. Yeah. But for me, that feels like your work. It's like one and done thing. Although I, I get the whole Sarah of it. I get that. Yeah. I get that's what people needed. However, for a lot of mm. times, you, when you build a masjid without any infrastructure inside it, yeah. without you being there committed to it, then it's kind of like an empty building and whoever yeah. wants to teach whatever they want goes there. Yeah. So you don't know what's being taught there. You don't know fundamentally if the message is being sent. Yeah. You know? So and building how many are even and, going, et cetera. Yeah. If you build a message and duck out, yeah. it's like you built a building and you don't know what's in there. You don't yeah. know what's being taught. You're not engaged. However, if you're building like a center that you're going to constantly mm. commit to, you're constantly going to, you know, fund like uh, lessons and resources and blah, 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 make it a center of the sort of community, that's fine. Yeah. But um, yeah, bro, I just want to be able to set other people up. Uh, yeah. In I think, I think my, the, the, unfortunately, like Dean wise, not unfortunately, actually, it's very good, but. My dad also made a big jump, like Dean wise, in terms of uh, knowing more like formal knowledge of the religion rather than just what's uh, inherited, you know. Yeah. Um, so he got a bit educated on that himself in his own journey yeah. Um, yeah. from from leaving Algeria and getting more educated. And I don't know how much progress I've made beyond what he had. So yeah. Um, I guess I've got time, but it depends how long I live. Yeah, I've got time well, to still it, yeah. do more. I think and, a lot of people get disheartened by the arbitrary sort of the modern day, because there's obviously two types of seeking knowledge. There's going to like an Islamic university or whatever, and then there's sitting at the feet of scholars. And I think because of like the University of Medina, for example, has this arbitrary 25 year old and you can't apply anymore. People think it's too late for them. Like oh, I was speaking yeah. to someone, he was like, oh, it's too late for me to go and study. Like, mm. 
no, it's not really because mm. that that structure has only existed for a certain amount of time. Before that, yeah. people were just going and they would study. It's not about it. certificates, man. Like you got to do it for your for yourself, for your own good, and for your family, and to be able to raise your kids upon <laughs> uh, <laughs> truth and stuff. So um, go this way, no, no, go this way, God. We don't want you on camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bro, I really have to go, man. It's yeah, really yeah. difficult. <laughs> Inshallah. Um, uh, well, I was just going to finish what I was saying. Uh, yeah, bro, it's not about formal um, education, like degrees and stuff. It's just, it's actually about uh, yeah. doing more acts of Ibadah and raising your, yeah, kid, yeah, yeah. Raising your yeah. kids, seeing you doing those acts of Ibadah. And yes, like, okay, I haven't memorized the Quran, but um, I, I, I was I was raised memorizing the Quran, but there was an age where I, I stopped, I suppose. So yeah. uh, for my kids, maybe there couldn't be more continuation of that and more emphasis on that and stuff. So yeah. there's, there could be big gains made there as well, inshallah. You'd, you'd like to be able to be in a position where you know the Quran and Sunnah to the level that every time you use an example or trying to give a lesson or try and give an advice, you can just draw from it immediately. Like that's yeah. the position I want to be in in terms yeah. of my deen. That's I want to be able right. to like, if I'm having a conversation with somebody and they're stuck or they want my advice, or whatever, mm -hmm. I immediately am able to go, oh, actually, well, there you go, take that. This is the advice I give you. Um, because that's what always keeps that link because people will feel like their solutions are then in the Quran and Sunnah as opposed to other people's opinions. Yeah. yeah. And, and I remember when I was on Hajj, or, or, I was with a group of people. There was like, I don't know, at least two people who father the Quran. And it's like everything you say, they're going to bring an ayah for it. Right. And yeah, even, yeah, yeah. even they'll make jokes with, with ayat of the Quran. So they'll say yeah. an ayat to you. And that's the, that's just the joke. Right. Obviously yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to understand it to get it. But it's like yeah. whether whether it's giving advice, whether it's joking, with it's like they have an A of everything, and so yeah. uh, that's a really good place to be. Uh, I I don't yeah. think it's too late for us to memorize the Quran, definitely. No, um, never. But uh, ultimately, it's good if we give our kids that head start and just make it just how they're gonna like learn their times table. Like try and make a new norm that you know yeah, yeah you're, you're you're just gonna learn it, you know. Yeah. So yeah, bro, this it's has been a really good topic, bro. I really enjoyed it. And inshallah, a lot of people will uh, relate to it because we're all mostly from immigrant backgrounds and stuff like that. Mm. So uh, I think we all have to think of our parents got us here. Where are we going to take it? I think it's a really good yeah. thing to think about. Yeah. Um, yeah. As usual, if you want to comment or ask questions or anything like that, go to mindheistpodcast.com. We've got the anonymous option. We've got the email option. Um, and share this podcast, you know, if you related uh, with it and you think uh, other people will, then just send, uh, you know, I do because not everyone's got like a uh, iPhone because with iPhones, it's easy to share a podcast because everyone's using the same podcast app, but with Android, it's difficult. So, um, I just screenshot it. I screenshot the title of the podcast and I just send it to people like, yeah, check whatever player you use, just check it out, you know? So mm -hmm. definitely share this inshallah, screenshot it, send it to a few people on WhatsApp, see if they enjoy it. And uh, yeah, that's all I've got to say. That's all I've got to say too, to be honest. Okay. You've said it all concisely. We will get to answer questions. I know we always say, send us your questions, but then we never really answer them. But it's because me and Amin just don't talk unless we're on the podcast. And when we, when we talk, we just, it's just mm. a natural flow. Mm. <laughs> yeah, we do a, a, a Q&A episode, whole episode, inshallah, at some point. Okay, subhanakallahumma, bihamdik, shadu an la ilaha, anta astaghfiruka, atubu alaik. This has been episode 86. Assalamu alaikum. 86.